Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the podcast of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm Sven Hosford. It is September 2nd. Yes, September. Where did the summer go? And here we are uh, looking at the fall and what a fall it's going to be. What a show it's going to be. We've got Steve Behrman, a.k.a. Swami Beyondananda. He will be with us uh, for the long interview this time. He is one of the funniest people you'll ever meet or ever read. And he is also the co-author with Bruce, Bruce Lipton of the book Spontaneous Evolution, which was a mind-blowing book about five years ago. He interviewed him back then and uh, can't wait to catch up on what all the latest science is in regards to epigenetics. He and Bruce Lipton are really the uh, some of the world's experts in epigenetics. And we've talked about that in several of the last podcasts, so I can't wait to get into that in more detail. Uh, in two weeks on this podcast, we'll be talking about Tai Chi with Gurney Bolster. She is bringing Dr. Paul Lamb to Pittsburgh, and uh, that is going to be a very fun event. We'll talk about that in two weeks. And in, uh, I'm sorry, that's coming up next week. We'll talk to Gurney Bolster. In two weeks, we'll be talking with Eric Goldman, who is the editor of Holistic Primary Care. Uh, he is also uh, putting on a conference in uh, October called Physician Heal Thy Practice. Uh, very interesting. Can't wait to get to talk to him. So all that's coming up. And in the calendar this week, uh, let's take a look ahead for September. We've been talking about this event quite a bit. It's Patty Lemmer and her vaccination conversation. Uh, if you haven't seen about it, heard about it, go back and watch the podcast. You get your tickets on eventbrite.com. Uh, search for Pittsburgh and vaccinations. It's going to be a calm, sedate, science-filled uh, conversation uh, about the latest, what they know about vaccines and toxic load and all sorts of interesting things. That's on September 12th. Now, on the 13th, another really cool event is happening out at RMU, and that's called uh, What's on Your Plate? It's a wellness event. Uh, a food and all kinds of really interesting thing, healthy food and wellness expo. Um, dozens and dozens of uh, vendors will be there with a pop-up podcast. That was such a great time we did that uh, the last time we were going to try that again. And then on the 19th, out at St. Clair and Export, uh, Friday evening, there will be the annual summer celebration, a celebration of success, an evening of food and socializing and drumming and playing some music and some special guests uh, sitting around the campfire out at St. Clair. Um, you can find out more about that at stclair.com. We've also invited the meetup group, and that's the Integrative Medicine Professionals Meetup. Um, hopefully, we'll see some of our 130 members come out to that. On the 25th of September, this is the event we were talking about, we'll be talking about next week, is when Dr. Paul Lamb uh, will be here. He's the founder and director of the internationally renowned Tai Chi for Health Institute, and he will be in Bethel Park. We'll talk to Gurney Bolster about that next week. And on the 27th of September in Canton, Ohio, Merging Hearts is hosting Swami Beyond Ananda. That's an evening of cosmic comedy. And then on the Sunday, the interactive play shop with uh, Steve and his wife, Trudy, called Involuntary Simplicity. I'm sure we'll hear all about that coming up in just a few minutes, too. Uh, on October 1st, you'll want to check out Dr. Uma Purag uh, Puragala, uh, Dr. Kim Hewitt, and Kim Pierce, RD, for a lifestyle seminar a lifestyle uh, medicine seminar at uh, St. Clair Hospital. And uh, we'll have a lot more details about that coming up. And you can find out more about that on our website. And we'll invite the integrated medicine professionals out for that event as well. Uh, we've been talking about this quite a bit. Uh, the November 2nd through the 4th, the Pittsburgh School of Massage Fall Conference for CEs at Seven Springs. Lots of great speakers. We're going to have at least one of them uh, on this show, this podcast, within the month. I'm pretty pretty confident on that. And then also in November, November 15th is Juice Fest. Uh, that's going to be coming up at the Pittsburgh Public Market, sponsored by Organically Social, our friend Trenton Ozipak and his gang. We've got lots of more exciting things coming up with Trenton that we'll be talking about in the future. So that'll do it for the calendar for this week. 
Steve Behrman has for many years been known by his alter ego name, Swami Beyondananda. His regular columns were popular in many New Age magazines across the country, including mine. And even as he skewered the woo-woo nonsense with silly puns and enlightened humor. His book, Spontaneous Evolution, co-written with Bruce Lipton, turned Darwinism on its ear, proving that evolution was neither random nor slow, but conscious and sometimes very, very fast. He'll be in Canton, Ohio in a few weeks on the 27th and 28th doing some comedy as the Swami on Saturday night, and then doing a play shop with his wife Trudy on, Sat on Sunday. So uh, both are very reasonably priced, and only a short drive from Pittsburgh, Yins should go. Welcome, Steve Behrman. Well, thank you, Sven. It's glad to be connected with you in Peaceburg. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we you had your point of light uh, publication. The Swami appeared in there. I'm still, many you know, many of these publications have migrated online and some have migrated right offline. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, the Swami is still um, creating cosmic comedy in the material world because there's plenty of material. There's plenty of material. I was going to say there's... It's uh, there's always something to talk about. Well, you've uh, you know we we talked right after your book came out. I think it was about two thousand nine, mm -hmm. and uh, you absolutely blew me away with some of the things in the book and what we talked about. And uh, epigenetics has really become the thing everybody's talking about. I, I swear it's been on the last five episodes of our podcast, especially when we talk about autism and uh, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, tell us what the last few years have been like and what's been happening in the world of spontaneous, what's been spontaneously evolving in your life? <laughs> well, you know, the way that I put it right now is that when Bruce Lipton and I wrote this book in 2009, we looked at spontaneous evolution as a noun in the future, and now it's becoming apparent it's a verb in the present. Uh, or as the Swami would say, the shift has hit the fan. I was going to uh, say, yeah. Things are really changing. In terms of epigenetics, uh, the idea that a lot of, um, well, I would say that a lot of what we have considered to be our human hardwiring is really software. Uh, that the, uh, the things that we've considered to be intrinsically human, uh, we're actually learning a lot of that is really based on um, uh, our, our programming, our beliefs, etc., etc. And so epigenetics is simply a, uh, uh, this, it's a growing science because as more and more people realize that um, so much of who we think we are is really our beliefs, our programming, our perceptions, uh, that uh, we've had to really reconsider, um, you know, the nature of human nature so to speak. And um, what what sort of areas are you seeing, uh, like really grab a hold of this? What pockets of science have, have taken off with the idea? Have you seen any, any real... Well, you know, actually what I've seen mostly has not been in the sciences. It's been in the, uh, in the social sciences. Uh -huh. That as our political, uh, I like to use the word, situation as our political <laughs> situation has become more dire uh it's becoming apparent uh that uh, as einstein's words you can't um actually solve a problem at the level it was created and so all of these fixes to try to fix uh, a system that's too big to not fail uh is actually failing and so we're beginning to look at the bigger picture of evolution not so much from a biological standpoint, but from the sociological standpoint, from the political, spiritual, psychological standpoint. So society and is evolving. It, whether it likes it or not. <laughs> um, you know, they say that crisis precipitates evolution. And if we look around us, uh, we see that the chances of precipitation are about 100%. <laughs> uh, there, there are crises in every domain, every... Every day I get some kind of something, some kind of news item, some kind of emailer that points us in the direction that everything that we've done until now inside the system of it's every cell for itself uh, is no longer workable. Uh, I think one of the great things that I got from 
Bruce Lipton and working on spontaneous evolution is the notion that evolution, uh, the next phase of human evolution is uh, telling us that, uh, that we are all cells in the same superorganism called humanity and that much of what we call, uh, well, certainly warfare and a lot of the unnecessary competition where uh, we're, you know, healthy humans are fighting other healthy humans is a form of autoimmune dysfunction that is very likely to uh, put us uh, in the um, in the crapper, so to speak. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's very interesting how many of the 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 metaphor holds up so well between the cells of the body and each of us as an individual person being the cells of a one human body uh, and call that one human body society and the ills we see in our body are reflected so well in the the ills in society um where do you think we're going to see the the fastest evolution uh, the, the the best crisis first <laughs> Well, that's really a good. That's really a good question. And I think that in the areas of economics and politics, um, mm -hmm. you know, we have a we have uh, an election year coming up in two years. This one's sort of gone, uh, and I think that there is a formidable uh, transpartisan, outside the box political um, infrastructure that's being created, even though it's completely invisible and off the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the yeah. pieces that hasn't been off the radar. Uh, there's a, a law professor from Harvard named Lawrence Lessig, L-E-S-S-I-G. And uh, over the 4th of July weekend, he created a super PAC uh, to essentially raise money to take money out of politics. Mm. And he was vastly successful. There was an overwhelming uh, feeling on the part of the people in this country that you know we have an unaccountable system um, we have a system where the two parties are partying on our dime and we haven't been invited to the party. Um, and neither political party really represents our true interest. And we've right. been divided into two tribes and, you know, divide and conquer and so on. Exactly. So I think that the, uh, the dire situation that we're seeing, uh, in every area of the world is going to, uh, create, uh, a migration away from politics as usual and uh, beginning toward uh, creating a, a, a overgrowing our system, an evolutionary upwising to overgrow the current system. Um, and so that's really the domain that I've been working on, the evolutionary upwising, the upwising. Uh, platform, and uh, also on a book on healing the body politic, which uh, yes. my, background, my background's in political science. Um, although, you know, I never did get far enough to actually dissect a politician. <laughs> Was that one of the advanced courses? <laughs> I never quite uh, got that. I quit before we got to that. But I, I'm afraid I know what I would find. Oh, there's no guts. Oh, there's no heart. No you know, spine, no, no brains, no heart. <laughs> you know. Well, but, you were... I think, yeah, we, we've actually uh, uh, asked our politicians for too much. We've asked them uh, to do much more than we've been willing to do. And so mm -hmm. I think part of the upwising and part of the area where evolution will show itself is in uh, the move toward political maturity, toward recognizing that if anything is to change, a critical mass of the heretofore critic uncritical masses have to do it before we achieve, unfortunately, critical massacre. <laughs> I mean, it's sad, so you got to laugh. That's why I do. Huh? Well, we're, I want to talk about the importance of humor after we get done laughing here. But um, with, our, with our podcast, we like to focus on uh, issues that would be of interest to medical doctors specifically and other uh, wellness and health professionals. Um, and one of the things that I think is really great about your book and I'd like to expand some more about is the whole idea of cooperation versus competition. And that's one of the key things about Darwinism is that survival of the fittest. And as you've said, it's, it's actually, the competition is actually very infrequent compared to the amount of cooperation that happens. And so it's more about the, how do you say it? The thrival of the fittingest? Thrival of the fittingest. Right. That, that which fits into uh, 
an evolving and healthy ecosystem is that which survives. So we are now at the point where we're seeing the, co the conflict between the planetary ecosystem and the human ecosystem. Mm. And, and so in terms of, of the Darwinism, uh, you know, as we go back and look at history, you know, we're always subject to the limitations of the beliefs that we have. And a good example of that is uh, in, in uh, 1787 when we created our constitution, we took a lot of that from the, from the Iroquois nation. Right. But the one piece that we couldn't take from them because it would really, um, our Western civilization was not prepared for it, was the Council of Grandmothers. Right. Uh, you know, the idea that it was the elder women uh, in the tribe who determined whether the tribe went, went to war and they could impeach a chief or and install a new one if they thought the chief was incompetent or unscrupulous. So the way this relates to Darwinism is that one of the glaring missing pieces in our perception, in our cultural perception, has been the feminine has been the part of us that is connected to nature, that is related to nature. And, um, you know, healing, as, as most doctors would agree, is both a science and an art. And uh, the focus on science, I mean, there are many people, if, you, if not us, but people that we know owe their lives to um, the mechanistic aspect of healing as it's developed over the past hundred years. At the same time, um, there is a bigger context to all of the content. I mean, one of the things that happens in medicine in terms of the content is that there are drugs prescribed for things and then there's counterindications and drugs prescribed to handle the counterindication. of, um, I would call it Newtonian medicine, because it's really dealing with a, uh, a reaction to uh, a reaction to a reaction that's purely on the linear reactive phase. And what science, physics, and now biology is coming to see is that, in Einstein's words, the field is the governing factor over the particles. So, most of what medicine is about and has been about uh, is mainstream um, allopathic medicine has been about dealing with the particles, moving those particles around. And we've all seen the great demonstration done by our science teachers in the sixth grade where you drop some, the science teacher drops some iron filings on a paper and holds a magnet under the paper and lo and behold, the iron filings arrange themselves according to the magnetic field. And so what medicine has been doing, and very, very diligently and with great, you know, a lot of hours put into this, a lot of time, a lot of money, is moving those particles around, moving those iron filings around, instead of noticing what is the field that is really <laughs> impacting that, okay? So the future of medicine, the immediate future, Hat, will be in discovering what those invisible, undiscovered fields are. We can see the out picture. I mean, if we didn't know what magnetism was, you know, you show that to somebody, you go, wow, those are some very intelligent iron filings. Exactly. <laughs> or irony filings, for that matter. Uh, and so what we're, what we're coming to recognize now, and see, it's interesting because you're um, – in 1981, there was a great book, very influential book written by Marilyn Ferguson called The Aquarian Conspiracy. I read it, yeah. And, uh, and she talked about how in every area of endeavor, from health to business to education to politics to economics, these new understandings about the new physics, about the relationship between things rather than simply the linear forces that are operating against one another, that those would come into play. And she had great predictions. And you know what? The only one that's come to pass has been the prediction uh, that holistic and complementary medicine would take hold mm -hmm. because that's the area that, um, that hits people where they live or in some cases don't live. Right, exactly. And, uh, and so that's the area that has accelerated progress over the last 30 years.
and it continues to progress. Uh, and I think that that may be the leader that may end up being, uh, because again, health and well-being has you know is very very close to our you know without health, what else do you have? Uh, if you look at the proliferation of locally grown food, proliferation of farmers markets, organic growing, Costco, Walmart, all of these big companies are looking to create more and more space for organics because they want to supply the demand. So if we want to look at where the demand is, people are demanding this holistic medicine, this energy-based medicine. Uh, and, you know, again, what the people desire, particularly if we're in a marketplace system, the market's going to have to provide. Sure. Well, I think it, uh, the other reason that uh, the medical industry is so ripe for this kind of transformation with the awareness of the field instead of just trying to track the iron filings is uh, almost every single one of the professionals that I know that does this sort of thing uh, from doctors all, all the way through the system have all been through their own health crisis, their own or about 85 to 90 percent or a family member or close friend for the others and they have seen firsthand the limitations of the system, and then they went out and tried the other things, the holistic and the crazy, and maybe perhaps even a little woo-woo, and lo and behold, you know, they come across a whole, I think there's a whole subculture in our society of people who've been sent home to die by the That's doctors. Right. And that was 20 years ago, because they went home, they changed their diet, they changed their thinking, they changed their field, and they got healthy. And and so I I just will get your your commentary on how those forces are helping to shift within the medical industry. Well, I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, I've I've actually spoken to doctors who um, had been prescribing certain procedures, and they've admitted that if it was me, I wouldn't undergo this procedure. Mm. If it was my sister or my child or my mother or my father, I would advise them not to. Um, and yet, uh, because the, 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 the two things that are unfortunately running our unhealthy healthcare system are uh, drug companies and, uh, and medical insurance conglomerates. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, there's pressure to prescribe more drugs. Um, you know, and if a doctor is not prescribing enough drugs, uh, they get, they get a, call, a call. Right. You must be, you know, are you not practicing? What's going on? Exactly. Uh, and that's how, you know, that's how competency is monitored. Um, and so there is, uh, you know, it used to be that, um, you know, that, that most M MDs were, you know, basically worked for themselves. They had low overhead. They didn't have to worry about great insurance. They had, didn't have to look over their shoulder to make sure that they're covering themselves to prescribe this or this or this or this or that procedure, even if they wouldn't do it themselves because the medical authorities are going to think that, you know, they're slacking off or they're falling prey to this holistic medicine. Oh, God forbid. I know uh, to, to the, a lot of doctors' credit, I, I have met some who would really like to take the time to teach their patients about nutrition and about mind-body practices and about de-stressing and all that sort of thing. They just simply don't have the tools within the system. There's nothing approved by the system to teach them. And then they're under the pressure of, well, you only have eight minutes with them anyway. Um, so even with doctors that would like to change the system, there's a whole, a great deal of pressure, as you said, from Men with suits, men with suits, and uh, <clears throat> that's. I guess my last question to you about the whole. I mean, girls with pantsuits too. Well, uh, there's a few of those. <laughs> what if we had like the, the council of grandmothers for our healthcare system? What kind of changes would that bring about? Let's say if we kept the Iroquois system, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to have like the the final Supreme Court for the whole healthcare system was a, a bunch of grandmothers, and they they decided whether that doctor could uh, do that. Procedure? Well, you know, I think I think that in this culture, even the grandmothers are tainted, and it would have to be a it would have to be a, something that was really um, even even a little further out. Uh, you know, I, I think that 
you know, one of, one of the things that we have to face uh, is that when we talk about the field, there really is such a thing as the field, mm -hmm. the field of law, the field of medicine, the field of education. So many years ago, I was a young teacher who went into the field of education. Mm. And one little particle is not going to change that field because that field recreates itself the way that it's been created unless there is a profound intervention. Uh, we've seen a profound intervention into the medical field, which has been the, the uh, surgeons of various forms of holistic medicine over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. At the same time, because the field is run by the power of money, and we have not recognized that we have to call forth a higher power of coherence, something that's bigger both than religion and non-religion. Some would call it the sacred. Now, whatever it is that religion is reaching for, uh, it can't really find the words for it. And so that's where we want to be, in the space that's really beyond words, beyond language, mm. beyond both religion and non-religion, to the unifying sense of what it is to be human, to the unifying, perhaps, principles yeah, that's at the foundation of every um, ethical, spiritual, and religious um, tradition, some form of the golden rule, some form of acknowledgement of the relatedness of everything. The problem with our healthcare system is not that, um, you know, it, it's not a, uh, a problem we could do this better and do that better or even have grandmothers on the board. It's really uh, has to do with, uh, with an existential question, which to me is, do we want to continue to exist as a, as a species? And in order to do that, we have to shift our entire field from it's me or you to it's me and you. Mm -hmm. And then we have to encourage other human beings to participate with their gifts in creating a healthy, wealthy commonwealth. Without that frame, you know, context is everything. We, you know, we live in a world of overwhelming content. The information is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so the co more complex the, the content, the simpler the context needs to be. Mm -hmm. And if we had the simple context that there is something sacred about being human, there is something sacred about life, and that our uh, science, uh, modern science and ancient wisdom is telling us we're all in it together. And that by focusing on that, by focusing on uh, individuals thriving uh, in the field of the common good, we can isolate the sociopathogens and redesign our institutions based on a healthier principle. And I see uh, so many times people are trying to impact the field as it is, and we need to overgrow that field by creating new fields. Well, I think this is the perfect place to start talking about humor and laughter and how important that is in changing the field. Um, would you say that's one of the fundamental tools that we can use? I think it is. You know, I've always loved humor. I've always been partial to it. I was the kid, you know, I mean, maybe people out there listening or watching, maybe you were the class comedian. And the way you know that you're, you're suited for that, it's the first time you're in the lunchroom and you make another kid laugh so hard that milk comes out of their nose. <laughs> That's a sign from God. So I've always loved humor. But now that I'm involved in, in looking at evolution and the nature of evolution, I see humor as an evolutionary tool because right now we need to evolve from thinking of things as either this or that to looking at it in a more emergent evolutionary way. That is, it's this and that and something else. So have you noticed that jokes, a lot of jokes are one, two, three, a minister, a priest, and a rabbi. Mm -hmm. Minister, priest, and a rabbi are having a conversation. They're, uh, they're speculating, how do they want to be remembered? What's their legacy? What do they want people to be saying when they're laying in their casket? The minister says, well, I want people to say he was a family man and a pillar of his community. The, the priest said, I want people to say he was a holy man and a leader of his flock. 
the rabbi says, I want people to say, look, I think he's breathing. (laughs) So comedy always offers us the third way. And uh, what's wonderful about humor is it stops the linear mind. It stops the mind. Uh. There's often, that's why there's an aha in the wake of the ha ha. Uh-huh. And then there's even an ah as we leave the dueling dualities of the mind and we drop into the coherence of the heart. Well, I think it's real important what you said. I want to repeat that. You said the comedy stops the linear thinking. Yes. Which, as we would, we've been discussing this whole time, the, the whole the whole shebang is about linear thinking versus holistic or group or yeah. cooperative. And, and by the way, because it, because the conversation has been so male domi- dominated, I would call it the he bang, the whole he bang. The whole. He- if we had more of a she bang, <laughs> we'd be getting more bang for our buck because we'd be balanced. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going there with. <laughs> Bang jokes. <laughs> Thank you for not going there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I, if I remember right, uh, you were uh, talking about humor and politics. You were the very first person after 2000 to talk about the electile dysfunction of our uh, whole system. And uh, I'm glad to see that your, your next book is going to keep on that same vein. <laughs> Before it becomes varicose, yes. Yes, yes. before. (laughs) It's been quite a varicose vein. Um, And, and, you know, I think that uh, comedy is maybe right now the only way to tell the truth. That's why so many people get their news from Jon Stewart and John Oliver and Colbert and... It's the only way you can take it. And so on. Yeah. Because it's, um, um, you know, we've been, uh, well, as the Swami would say, We've been involved since the end of World War II uh, with a don't ask, don't tell program. The government has promised, we've, the people have promised not to ask the government what it's doing, and the government has promised not to tell us. Yeah, exactly. So we've been in, locked in this secrecy, and um, you know, particularly since the Kennedy assassination, we've been in PTSD. And uh, we don't think clearly under PTSD. I think you're right. Comedy is an awakening tool. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, any any thoughts or anything you want to say about all of that as it relates to Robin Williams and and his role in comedy and and, and you know I just did a little piece today. I I, I kind of waited because there was so much being written mm-hmm. and um, you know I think that he definitely was attuned to his own comedy channel and. Um, Perhaps, you know, the Mozart of comedy uh, in being such a prodigy, in being able to feed uh, our culture back to us and the language of that culture, to point out the absurdities, to play it back to us in such a way that we laughed, laughed, laughed. And whatever, I, I, I wouldn't even speculate on why he did what he did uh, all I would say is that you know humor is a great tool, but sometimes humor isn't enough. Mm. And um, you know there are those who you know talk about you know was he taking psychiatric drugs? Was he taking drugs for his um, Parkinson syndrome or depression that might have had the side effects of pushing him over the edge? And you know that's a mystery he'll take with him to the great mystery. Mm. Um, but I think that um, it it was a tragedy of the heart. I think we you know we we uh, we lost something, and I think the field is now clear. I think that in a certain regard, Robin Williams could take comedy so far. He was still inside the system, and it's time now for comedy to take us a little bit more outside the system. Mm-hmm so that we can really use it to reflect on the very deep, uh, sometimes tragically funny, sometimes toxic uh, beliefs that we have mistaken for reality. And as the opposite of the neutron bomb, uh, comedy can become a weapon of mass deconstruction and allow ideas that have outlived their uselessness to fall by the wayside and leave us standing. 
Yeah. Well, let's hope. I, I you know, when I look back on the, the last hundred years or so of politics, and I think about all the political political humorists and people like Will Rogers, who said, uh, "I'm not a member of an organized political party. I'm a Democrat." Um, you know that there's always been that political humor, and I think it's always been something that's driving the change. So I'm I'm really happy to see that the Swami and you are still thriving. Uh, being a, a thrivalist, um, why don't you? <laughs> thrival uh, of the fitting us. We're here for thrival for all. And uh, I, you know, the survivalists they can hunker in the bunker. The thrivalists are dancing in the streets. <laughs> well, that's going to be the quote of the day. I think. <laughs> tell us about uh, tell us about your weekend coming up in Canton, Ohio. You got a Saturday night. I am so excited about yeah. being in Canton. In fact, I'm I'm even learning Cantonese. <laughs> I, I'm very happy. There's a wonderful organization. They're called Merging Hearts. And they're a uh, a holistic center. Um, they are they are kind of a, a bright spot in the gathering place, and um, they're excited about people from other uh, other towns like Pittsburgh and Columbus yeah. and anywhere in the vicinity. And uh, if you contact them, and um, you'll have the contact information. It's yeah, a, we just put on it my up on calendar. Screen. Wake up laughing. Um, They'll even help you find lodging. They have some people in their community that's, that are, would love to host kindred spirits oh, from different towns. And uh, so the weekend will be a cosmic comedy performance with Swami on Saturday night, the uh, 27th. Uh, that, uh, and, um, you know, the first part of the Swami show uh, is, you know, routine, you know, comedy, et cetera, et cetera. But the second half of the show, or and the second half, is all questions from the audience. So uh. if you have an answerable question, the Swami will have a questionable answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day, <laughs> on Sunday, 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 my wife Trudy and I will be um, doing a interactive play shop called Involuntary Simplicity, where we, we uh, talk about our own journey in applying spontaneous evolution in our lives in the real world and uh, in these times of great complexity having a simple context mm. is very very helpful we've also downsized simplified our lives um, and um, I think a lot of people right now are wondering how to get through these um, financial times you know of course you know many Many great spiritual teachers have uh, long, um, you know, they've been praying for a moneyless society, and look how many people have a head start. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're, We're getting get, there. I'm <laughs> oh, don't give me and started so, on that either. And so the involuntary <laughs> simplicity uh, play shop, it's a way for people to um, really get a, a, a more clear picture about this evolutionary upwising that's taking place, and even more exciting, how to weave their own vision, mission, skills, talents, and heart's desire into a larger tapestry that creates good goods and great goodness. Well, that's, that's wonderful. I, uh, I hope I can make it out there. That sounds like a really fun event. And uh, I, I love the title, too, The Involuntary Simplicities, and that's been forced on so many of us <laughs> so quickly. <laughs> well, you know, we had time for voluntary simplicity when the book was written in 1980, but now uh, I think that the forces of evolution are involuntary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, do we have free will? Well, absolutely. You can continue to spit into the wind as much as you like, and there's... And the wind will continue to do what it does, but you have the free will to spit into the wind. Mm -hmm. So exactly. as we're coming to realize, uh, we want to notice which direction uh, evolution is taking, and we want to ride the universe in the direction it's going. Well, it's important whether you're spitting into the wind or the shift is hitting the fan that you know which way the wind is blowing. I think that's, that's, right. that's pretty important. Well, I want to thank you, Steve. This has been a, a really fun and great conversation. So fun to talk to you again. 
Good. And I look forward to seeing you on the outer net and say hi to all of our friends in Peaceburg. We'll do uh, that. Let me know when this thing is up and I'll let everybody know about it. That's great. We, we, Thanks, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. And that will, that will do it for this week. Uh, join us again next week for another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. You can find us on Facebook and Google+, Plus, as well as YouTube, iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher. And uh, we'll also be hosting uh, Integrative Medicine Professionals on the meetup.com. Be sure you check out our page there. And once again, thanks to Steve Behrman. And what a great conversation. And we'll see you again next time. Until then, uh, Yuns, be careful out there.